there's a way to win a man's heart, and it's not by force. The original Japanese run of the magical girl anime Sailor Moon is, like, gay. Like, really, really gay. Not like queer Cody, queer Beatty gay. Like, explicitly, canonically gay. So let's talk about what happened when it came to America. It's actually pretty interesting that Sailor Moon is as gay as it is, considering the time and place of its original release. Japan, unlike the United States, does not have this Puritan history that says that homosexuality is a cardinal sin. It isn't uncommon to see LGBTQA plus celebrities and animated characters. But on an individual level, the story is a different one. Families will disown LGBT children. Queer youth get bullied on schoolyards. Finding a job can be difficult if you're gay. The list goes on and on. In Japan, homosexuality is not illegal, and hasn't been for a very long time. But it also isn't necessarily accepted by your average Japanese grandma. Most LGBT representation in Japan is fantastical, or, well, pornographic. It's okay and accepted for a fictional magical girl to be gay, but not for you to be. Representation in Japan has only recently been making great strides with more grounded shows like Yuri on Ice or Banana Fish, the latter of which, spoilers for Banana Fish, kind of falls into the harmful trope, bury your gaze. But remember, this is the 90s we're talking about, not 2016. And Sailor Moon definitely fell more into the fantastical camp of acceptable LGBT representation in Japan at the time, making it more appropriate in the eyes of a conservative Japanese audience. But to American kids watching two girls holding hands in a earnest romantic relationship, this was groundbreaking stuff, and stuff American parents of the 90s were not going to swallow easily. In 1995, the first two seasons of Pretty Guardian Sailor Moon were dubbed in English by DIC Productions, now Wild Brain Productions, and brought over to the United States and Canada. This adaptation, and I say adaptation and not dubbing for reasons I'll get into later, um, definitely had a tumultuous history. Tumultuous. Did I say that right? <laughs> Spending much of its time airing during dead time slots, getting canceled, rescheduled, and then canceled again, seeing a resurgence in interest, etc. It was a wild ride for this adaptation of Sailor Moon. The DIC dub is the dub most children of the 90s are going to be familiar with, watching it on 4Kids and Toonami. I call it an adaptation and not a direct dub because, to be honest, calling it a direct dub is kind of a stretch. If you are looking for a direct dub, I'd highly recommend the recent Viz Media dub. The DIC dub changed almost everything about the original show. <laughs> Names were changed, making them more palpable for Western audiences. For example, Usagi became Serena, Mamoru became Darian, and Naru became Molly. Molly also adapted just a fantastic accent. <laughs> it's not me! I'm worried about Katie! I think something's wrong with her! Not only were names changed, but entire episodes removed. Sequences deleted. Character arcs shifted. Any type of violence, especially violence against children, was completely removed. Which does absolute wonders for your show about a 14-year-old superhero. <laughs> Most notably for our discussion today, the show as a whole became a whole lot less gay. How did they do this? A lot of reworking. <laughs> With sometimes comical results. Let's start with season one.
Season one of Sailor Moon introduces us to our first set of iconic villains. Queen Beryl and her four heavenly kings. Jedite, Nephrite, Kunzite, and Zoisite. It's worth noting here that this group greatly differs from their manga incarnation. In the manga, the four heavenly kings were originally the guardians of Prince Endymion, Mamoru, Tuxedo Mask. These three are all the same person. <laughs> Sorry, spoilers if you didn't know that Mamoru is Tuxedo Mask. Oh my god, he is Tuxedo Mask. <laughs> I am Tuxedo Mask! You are? He is Tuxedo Mask, I don't believe it. Suspicion and distrust surrounding the moon's constant surveillance of Earth led the four heavenly kings to turn their back on the prince and team up with the nefarious Queen Beryl. <laughs> it is also heavily implied that these four kings had romantic relationships with the inner Sailor Scouts during their previous lives. Where this differs in the original anime is also where things get interesting. The anime is definitely more vague when it comes to four heavenly kings lore. In fact, I'm pretty sure they're never even explicitly referred to as the four heavenly kings. They're just kind of some guys who hang out with Queen Beryl. <laughs> They also did away with the implication that they ever had a romantic history with the Inner Scouts, opening things up to other possibilities. Like the possibility that Kunzite and Zoisite are in a romantic relationship. Which they are! <laughs> There's no getting around the fact when you watch the original Japanese run of this anime that Kunzite and Zoisite are both men and both very much in love with each other. They embrace, they exchange gifts, they call each other beautiful. <laughs> What is the Puritan state of American cartoons in the 90s to do? Well, these are both guys with longer hair. They made one of them a lady. They made Zoisite a lady. They took her boy Zoisite, dubbed him over with a female voice, changed the spelling of his name, made his personality more needy and obnoxious, and washed their hands of the whole matter. Oh shoot, I just realized I'm not- I'm not wearing my Sailor Scout gloves! Hold on, I'll be right back. That's much better. Oh my goodness, I wasn't fully dressed. <laughs> Anyways, yes, they made Zoisite into a woman. <laughs> oh, you're scaring me. Zoy! Which honestly was more convincing than what other countries tried to do to write the gay away. The most common workaround, aside from turning Zoisite into a woman, was making the two into brothers. Very touchy brothers. <laughs> I also once read a rumor that I can't find any evidence for, that in one of the censored dubs, the two were presented as a father and son, which is... But hey, at least they're not gay. That should be like the motto of like 90s Sailor Moon dubs. Hey, at least they're not gay. <laughs> Speaking of accidental incest, Mara and Michelle. Oh, great. Why do you think they've entered the contest? They're girls and cousins, too. If you are at all familiar with Sailor Moon's history of censorship, this is probably why. <laughs> Haruka Tenno and Michiru Kayo, Sailor Uranus and Sailor Neptune, respectively, were introduced in Sailor Moon Chapter 24 in the manga. In the Season 3 episode, A Handsome Boy, Haruka Tenno's Secret in the anime. It's an interesting title. In both the original manga and the original Japanese anime, the two are, well, couple goals. <laughs> Seriously, look at these two. Me and who, when? Just kidding, I'm already married and very much in love. Why? Bob, have you ever been in love? I, I guess, I, I technically am. Hi! Uranus specifically is presented as bi-gender. Remember the title of the episode they first showed up in? 
Told you it was interesting. <laughs> What's really cool about this portrayal of a bi-gender character is that it's viewed as like a superpower. Haruka is stronger and, well, cooler because of her bi-gender status. She's more male presenting when not transformed and more female presenting when acting as Sailor Uranus. She's even mistaken for a man when she's first introduced to the inner Sailor Scouts, leading to a valuable teaching moment about what it means to be non-binary. A teaching moment that actually repeats a few times throughout the series. Never as a punchline, these interactions are always positive ones. And they posed a problem for the team over at DIC. <laughs> Unlike with Zoisite, they couldn't just switch around Haruka's gender. In almost every episode she appears in, she transforms into the more feminine Sailor Scout uniform from a more masculine outfit. What is a localization team to do? Well, instead of changing the gender of one of the characters to make things more hetero, they changed the relationship. Opting to instead introduce Haruka and Michiru, uh, sorry, Amara and Michelle, <laughs> Amara, <laughs> as cousins. Very, very close <laughs> cousins. <laughs> Amara, Michelle! Fantastic! You're the best cousins in the world! Even inventing old boyfriends for the pair to really drive the hetero point home. I remember it vividly. It was with Brad, the cutest guy in the school. This makes for some very interesting moments. <laughs> with a lot of dialogue that explicitly states that they are cousins, so you do not forget that these two are straight. <laughs> the end result is honestly pretty comical. There's really just no writing around the fact that these two are in love when they're constantly making baby doll eyes at each other. If anything, this change just made it seem like these two cousins were in a romantic relationship. Haruka Tenno was not the only non-binary character who needed some censoring. Things are about to get very... fishy. Also making their appearance in Season 3, the Amazon Trio is a villain group consisting of Tiger's Eye, Hawk's Eye, and Fish Eye. They are loyal followers of the evil Zirconia. In the manga, the trio as a whole definitely behaves in a more feminine and flamboyant manner than they do in the anime. In the anime, however, Tiger's Eye and Hawk's Eye are definitely more masculine, with Fish Eye seemingly being the only female member. Fish Eye wears makeup, disguises themselves in dresses, and seems to only have a romantic interest in men, taking a special interest in Mamoru. It's not until you notice the other members of the Amazon trio referring to this character using he, him pronouns that it starts to dawn on you that this character might be LGBT. And then it happens. Def. Con. Nipple. In the episode Close Call, Fisheye removes their top, revealing their bare, breastless chest. <laughs> okay, so probably LGBT. I won't get into whether Fisheye is a trans woman or a gay cross-dressing man. That's something that's been up for debate since the episode aired. Honestly, if interpreting the character in whatever way makes you feel more represented, then go for it. So the interesting thing about Fisheye is that even though they do fall into the queer villain trope, they're actually an incredibly sympathetic character. Easily the most sympathetic of the Amazon trio. And they do earn a redemption by the end of their arc. The character honestly has a lot of complexity that other Sailor Moon villains lack. They have emotional depth and exhibit a lot of growth. Their gender identity, like Haruka's, is never a punchline. Mamoru doesn't reject them because of their gender identity, but because he's already committed to Usagi. With all that said, the DIC dub did the obvious thing and turned Fisheye into a cisgender, heterosexual woman. What's kind of interesting here is that they actually kept the close call episode, editing around Fisheye's chest to make it seem like this cis woman has just revealed her boobs to a room full of men. <laughs> Which, 
You're right, guys. That's much better than having a canon gender non-conforming character. Excellent. Good. But what happens when there's not a single line of dialogue or a single scene that can be edited around? What happens when you can't just cut the episode? Let's talk about the lost final season of Sailor Moon. Sailor Moon Stars is the fifth and final season of Sailor Moon. The main plot follows the scouts as they meet up with the Sailor Starlights, followers of the Princess Kaku, who are on Earth disguised as male idols trying to find their missing princess. The Sailor Scouts go back and forth about whether or not the Starlights are friends or foes, with the Outer Scouts, Uranus especially, having a very hard time accepting these newcomers. One of the Starlights, Sailor Star Fighter, Earth name Seiya, especially rubs Haruka the wrong way. Why? Well, because Seiya is in love with Usagi. <笑>だと? お前らみたいのがいたんじゃ。帰ってあぶない。お前らって僕たちまで一緒にしないでよ。やと。放っておきなさい。ちょっとうさぎ、あの did I mention Mamoru goes missing during this season? Mamoru's missing and Usagi and Seiya are like going on dates and stuff. Haruka thinks this is a bad idea. There's only one alpha lesbian allowed in this anime, I guess. <laughs> the relationship doesn't end up going anywhere. Usagi's heart belongs to Mamoru, of course. If you were an American Sailor Moon fan of the 90s and none of this sounds familiar to you, there's a reason for that. This season was so gay, the outfits so sexy that they just could not work around it. And the whole season wasn't localized until 2005, nearly a decade after the original localization. Like with Uranus, at least in the anime, the starlights are male presenting when in their human everyday forms and female presenting while in their scout forms. But things go a step further with these guys. When they transform, so do their bodies. Most notably, growing and ungrowing <laughs> breasts. This differs from the manga where a physical transformation doesn't occur. The group are simply cross-dressing women. This does open up the door for an interesting conversation about the gender identities of the Sailor Starlights. One that's a hot topic of debate within the fanbase. And one that I'll let you mull over yourselves. The general consensus, however, is that Seiya is a lesbian in love with Usagi. Seiya wasn't the only problem when it came to censoring stars, though. Michiru and Haruka also stepped their relationship up a notch. Shown to be living together and raising the child Sailor Saturn as surrogate parents during the first part of the season. These two also really cannot stop flirting. Like, it's a lot but not in a bad way. A bit ironically, this lost season, okay, it was never actually a lost season, I just keep calling it that because it sounds a bit dramatic. <laughs> is actually my favorite of the 90s anime. It has the largest cast of any season, which honestly makes things a lot of fun. It's just a bummer that it was buried for so long, as was a lot of the representation erased by censorship in 90s America. There's a lot more we could talk about here. There's even a movie about Mamoru's jealous ex-boyfriend. Okay, that one's not explicit, but the context is there. Go watch the Sailor Moon R movie to see for yourself. 
But I'd like to stop here and say that I'm by no means claiming that the original Japanese run of Sailor Moon is some paragon of LGBTQA plus representation. Like I said at the top, Japanese LGBT representation, especially at the time, was primarily either fantastical or pornographic. And this was fantastical. But that doesn't mean it still doesn't mean a lot to LGBT youth around the world. And it could have meant so much more to so many more kids if it were allowed to. I can't help but think of how many kids of the 90s could have benefited from seeing this kind of representation on their screens. And smile at how many kids get to see it now, thanks to the Viz dub and the subtitled versions. Things have come so far when it comes to representation, both in the Western world and in Japan. And that's definitely something to celebrate. But we still have a long way to go. According to the LGBT happiness study, LGBT adolescents show the highest rate of suicide, which scientific research and common sense links to homophobic attitudes. Now, obviously something as simple as more representation is not going to cure homophobia, as evidenced by the treatment of LGBT youth on a personal level in Japan. But I think it could help you feel less alone. I'm going to link some resources and places to donate down below. Wowie zowie, I've been sitting on this one for a while. If you know me, like at all, you know that after a couple of drinks, this is like my go-to topic of drunk rambling. <laughs> like I am obsessed with this topic and Sailor Moon, Sailor Moon phone case. <laughs> I have an animation cell actually of fisheye that I'll, I'll put a picture of it right here, but it's sitting right up there. <laughs> I love Sailor Moon. I was very excited to make this video. And I hope you enjoyed listening to me talk about it. If you did, why not give this video a thumbs up? Leave a comment, share it, even subscribe. Let the algorithm know that you liked this video. <laughs> Speaking of subscriptions, I'm thinking of doing like a Q&A video once I hit 2k subs. Um, let me know if you're into that or if you think it's a stupid idea. Because if it's a stupid idea, I won't do it. Be honest. <laughs> If you really like what you see, you can help support the channel by becoming a patron or buying some merch. Patrons get fun little perks like credit at the end of the video, access to our Discord, um, monthly blooper reels, etc. Links to both of those things are in the link tree down in the description. If you didn't like this video, please fill out and mail Form 26C in no more than two weeks and we will try to resolve the issue. Bye. It is also heavenly, heavenly. <laughs>